So you've heard of this weird bacteria-like organelle called mitochondria. It makes over 90% of all the energy we use. It has its own genome. In humans, it is around 16.5 kilobases, which happens to be circular and double-stranded just like the bacteria. Interestingly, one of the two strands happened to be heavier than the other, so we call it the H and L strands. The heavier one has a lot of guanines, and the lighter one has a lot of cytosines. Guanines are double-ringed versus cytosines are single-ringed, and that explains the heavy versus the light difference. For our discussion, we will call the outer strand the heavy strand, and the internal strand as the light strand. We will get into the details later, but for now, you need to know that the L strand carries the origin of replication called Ori H, whereas the heavy strand carries Ori L. This simply means that the Ori H is used to make the H strand. Since it is on the L strand, the L is used to make H. Likewise, Ori L being on the H strand means that it is used to make the L strand using the H strand as a template. Something that will become relevant later is that the distance between the two origins on one side is around 11 kilobases. This is called a major arc, and it is replicated first. The 5.5 kilobases is called the minor arc, which is replicated after the major arc. The Ori H site is within a 1 kb non coding region. We will shortly talk about this in detail. The only caveat to origins is that origin H and L are perhaps best thought of as a large region instead of an exact spot. One interesting feature about this mitochondrial genome is that it only has 37 genes. 13 of them are meant for oxidative phosphorylation, which you may have learned through the electron transport chain in biochemistry. Two of these 37 are ribosomal gene, and the remainder 22 are transfer RNA genes needed for translation. So more than half of the mitochondrial genes are non-protein coding. In essence, this lazy bacteria has outsourced most of its genes to the nucleus. In a way, mitochondria is perhaps closer to an obligate parasite than a bacteria. Relevant to this video, the DNA polymerase, helicase, ligase, and RNA polymerase, and pretty much everything, is made by the nucleus. Now let's get into the discussion. You will notice that replication of mitochondrial DNA is special in some ways. There are no special proteins required to identify the origins. In bacteria, we saw DNA A and DIA proteins. In eukaryotes, you have the orcs. Nothing of that sort exists here. There are also no Okazaki fragments in this replication method. So both strands are pretty much continuously replicated without any break. And only one DNA polymerase is required for the entire DNA replication. The replication bubble is kind of weird in a way that it moves asymmetrically. This comes from the fact that part of the DNA replicates first and the other part a bit later. Normally, when we discuss replication bubbles, we think of bubble at the origin expanding and extending in both directions. In this asymmetric and atypical bubble, the replication starts and continues only in one direction. Before we get into the mechanism, there are three enzymes to keep in mind. The one and only DNA polymerase gamma, which is made of one alpha subunit and two beta subunit, so it is a heterotrimer. The alpha subunit is the catalytic core. The betas are just accessory and help stabilize the alpha subunit. Some species don't even have this beta subunit, so don't take it too seriously. The core also has the exonuclease or proofreading activity to fix any replication errors on the way. The helicase is called twinkle, which functions as a hexameric complex. When it was identified under the microscope, the images resembled stars on a dark night, hence twinkle. The third enzyme is Paul RMT, or polymerase RNA of mitochondria. And now we can get into the mechanism of replication. Let me give you the vanilla version before any details. The replication starts at the origin H, where twinkle and DNA polymerase are recruited. The twinkle unbinds the DNA while moving on the H strand. Simultaneously, the DNA polymerase uses the L strand to make a copy. 
the Twinkle and DNA polymerase continue towards the direction of Ori L, and there comes a time when they pass over it. This is what it means to be a major arc, which is that it gets replicated first. Now, as the Ori L gets unbound by the moving Twinkle, the single stranded Ori L turns into a stem loop structure. It then recruits a DNA polymerase, which now moves into the direction of major arc and copies DNA. Here, too, the major arc is copied first. So in the second phase, the OREL also starts DNA replication. Both these DNA polymerases will continue on their respective strands and eventually circle back to their starting position, since this is a circular DNA. And this leads to the replication termination and gives you two identical copies of the starting DNA. That was the vanilla version of the entire process. Now let's add some proper details to the mechanism, which is best understood through the strand displacement model. We will start with the Ori H, which is contained in a complex non-coding region of about 1000 bases in length. This region contains the Ori H, the termination associated sequence, three specific positions marked as conserved sequence blocks, and at the upstream is the promoter on the light strand. It all starts when the light strand promoter recruits RNA polymerase. This means the transcription starts from the LSP into the direction of Ori H. But something funny happens during this transcription. The RNA that is made strongly binds to the template instead and forms a RNA DNA hybrid. The troubling part about this is that the CSB2 on the H strand contains a G rich sequence which can form G quadruplexes. Remember, H strand is rich in guanines. Now the RNA that is made on the L strand is also G rich. So both RNA and the H strand DNA come together at the CSB2 to form a hybrid G quadruplex. All these events happen when the RNA polymerase is close to CSB1 and about to transcribe a poly U region. This G quadruplex and the U rich transcription causes RNA polymerase to stall and eventually terminate transcription. After transcription, you're left with the transcribed RNA stuck in this weird G quadruplex structure. The G quadruplex is also called the R loop, which as we said is a hybrid structure in this case. Now to clean this mess, RNAs H1 comes in and chops up this RNA into smaller pieces. However, the RNA loop structure is resistant to the RNAs H1 degradation. While this is happening, the single stranded DNA on the H strand is being protected by the mitochondrial single strand DNA binding proteins. And if we clean up this mess, you get this simple RNA loop with tiny overhangs at both 5 and 3 prime end. Now the mitochondrial SSBs somehow recruit the helicase and DNA polymerase onto the single strands. I say somehow because no one has any idea how this recruitment process actually works. Maybe there is another protein involved, maybe not, but no one knows. So eventually the DNA polymerase picks up at the edge of the 3' end of the RNA to start DNA synthesis, whereas hexameric twinkle unbinds the double-stranded DNA by moving on the H strand. Note that most of the time, the polymerase starts DNA synthesis upstream of CSB1. In this scenario, the start is asymmetric, simply because there is only one 3' end available for DNA polymerase to make DNA. In addition, there is no primase involved in this process. The RNA polymerase takes care of the primer portion. Also, you have noticed that there is no clamp loader as well, so the enzyme is processive without any additional help. So this is how the Ori H replication starts first, and now both the helicase and polymerase start moving towards the Ori L position through the major arc. This mechanism is invoking strand displacement, but there are other models like retols and strand coupling which offer different views of the replication. They're kinda sus, so I won't waste your time discussing them. Anyways, there is a small catch before the DNA polymerase can move ahead. It runs into this termination sequence. So let's first understand the regulation before the polymerase gets any further. You may come across this feature under the name of D loop. 
we turn our attention on to this intermediate structure as the DNA polymerase is moving on the non-coding region. This happens post-RNase H1 digestion, and both twinkle and DNA polymerase now have moved a little bit farther from the start. As the polymerase reaches the termination sequence, it falls off and terminates replication. The length of this short DNA is about 650 nucleotides in length, and it is called 7S DNA. The S means Swedberg, which is what we saw in ribosomal RNA descriptions. It is only a measurement of time, so the 7S has nothing to do with RNA. The 7S DNA now remains tightly bound to the L strand, which means it leaves out this H strand in a loop called displacement loop. Interestingly, the TAS region contains a sequence that matches a short sequence just upstream of CSB1. How these sequences, or TAS in particular, may perform termination has not been answered yet. Maybe there is a protein that binds them and makes some sort of loop or secondary structure that traps the DNA polymerase. The function of the displacement loop is also unclear. Is it simply a bystander, an artifact of the process, or is there something more to it? Also, since 7S DNA is tightly bound to the L strand, the resolution of this DNA is also unclear. This is not some rare event. Almost 95% of all replication initiation is abortively terminated at this particular region. Some think that it is a way to control the copy number of mitochondrial DNA in each mitochondria. But no one knows how exactly it is done. For our sake of discussion, let's just assume that the DNA polymerase and twinkle reach the OREL. This starts the OREL initiation through this stem loop structure. As I mentioned, when the twinkle unwinds the OREL region, the single-stranded DNA takes on a stem loop structure. The double-stranded stem is about 11 nucleotides and the loop is 12 nucleotides. The rest of the single-stranded DNA is bound by the SSB proteins. But the SSB cannot bind the double-stranded stem of this stem loop. And the loop is too compact for SSBs to bind. SSB needs at least 15 to 20 nucleotides to bind. The loop is only 12 nucleotides. The initiation at this loop starts when SSBs recruit RNA polymerase to this location. Again, how this recruitment occurs is unclear. Specifically, the RNA polymerase is recruited at the loop structure. The loop is a T-rich loop, which means that the RNA polymerase starts with the addition of adenines. The moving RNA polymerase unwinds the stem loop structure when it transcribes. The RNA here too remains bound to the DNA. The interesting thing to note is that the template for this transcription is single-stranded DNA, because the other template is engaged in DNA replication. This makes the transcription very unstable at this loop. This is in contrast to the normal transcription where you have RNA polymerases recruited to a double-stranded DNA, and it unwinds the DNA while remaining in contact with the non-template strand. This makes the polymerase more stable for transcription. In this case, the instability on the single-stranded DNA causes RNA polymerase to terminate transcription just after 25 nucleotides or so. So once the RNA polymerase is released, the SSB recruit again DNA polymerase at the 3' end of the RNA. The DNA now can start elongating from the OREL location. A couple of things to note here. One is that the initiation at OREL is a late start. Second, the helicase and DNA polymerase from the OREL are moving in opposite directions. So the movement per se of DNA polymerase from OREL is sort of independent of the helicase movement. Once the elongation is complete, the enzymes will eventually return to their starting positions because the template is a circular DNA. This will result in termination. Since we're discussing OREL, let's understand how replication from OREL is terminated. So here is the OREL position when the DNA polymerase comes back full circle. Most of the initiating RNA is removed by the RNase H1. It, however, leaves behind 1 to 3 nucleotides of RNA. But the DNA polymerase doesn't mind this and keeps moving ahead. And as the DNA polymerase moves, a flap is generated, which in this case is an RNA-DNA flap. But because of this flap, the DNA polymerase cannot keep moving, so eventually it gives up and terminates replication. 
the flap is then removed by endonucleases like FEN1 or EXOG. We still don't know which exact nuclease does this step. But once the flap is removed, the two disjointed strands are glued together by the DNA ligase 3. And this is the OREL termination. Now let's move to the OREH termination, which is slightly different and a tiny bit weird. Here's the sketch of the DNA polymerase and twinkle when they eventually circle back to the starting point. Originally, the RNase H1 could not degrade this R loop, but once twinkle comes around, it unwinds the G quadruplex like it's nothing. The unwinding of the R loop exposes the RNA, and now it becomes the target for RNase H1 degradation. But RNase H1 isn't perfect, so it leaves behind some bits of RNA. Now we come to the weird part of this termination. Even before the DNA polymerase has reached the 5' end of the RNA primer in the front, a flap is pre-generated for the DNA polymerase. So strand displacement happens even before the polymerase gamma gets a chance. This flap thing is so precise that the length of the DNA that is flapped out is about 191 bases from the edge of the 5' end. And this matches the exact position of this suspiciously proposed Uri H location. So what is this voodoo magic step? How do you get this flap? Well, I don't know the answer, and so far, no one does. But there is a speculation that the LSP recruits RNA polymerase, which can transcribe ahead, and displace the strand in the front. So maybe transcription is the answer, but no one actually knows. And no one knows why it stops at this exact spot. But what we do know with certainty is that the flap is digested by an endonuclease called MGME1. Because all this occurs when DNA polymerase returns from its long 16 KB journey through the genome, it does not have to do much work, but simply terminate replication at the 5' end. Then finally, the DNA ligase 3 comes in and seals the deal. And this completes replication termination at the OREH. When both the H and L strands are replicated, they are problematically entangled in this chain-like structure. Topoisomerase 3-alpha are usually hanging around in mitochondria to fix these problems, which then finally results in two independent DNA molecules. And this completes our discussion. 